This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Get two months of free access to over 25,000 courses by visiting the link in the description. In 2018, California experienced its worst wildfire season ever recorded. Over 8,000 fires burned nearly 3,000 square miles, the largest area burned in one single season. That's almost the size of Puerto Rico. What's worse is that thousands of homes burned and over 100 people died. The campfire, a wildfire that engulfed the town of Paradise, contributed most of those fatalities. It's tempting to think of wildfires as a natural disaster we can't control, but often the fires are a result of human activity. Cigarette butts, arson, and power lines can all spark a fire just as easily as lightning. And in places like California, fire is a part of the ecosystem. Wildfires are healthy. What's not healthy is building homes and neighborhoods in areas prone to these fires. In this video, we're going to get into how we've let people build in these dangerous areas, and the ways we can use good planning to make everyone safer. Let's start by going over some Wildfire 101. Wildfires are uncontrolled fires burning combustible material in rural areas. The Great Chicago Fire was one wildfire, but it wasn't a wildfire. You need a few basic ingredients for a wildfire. First, you need the aforementioned ignition source. Then you need a fuel, which is typically leaves or grass. Dry air makes it more likely for a fire to start and grow, so the biggest wildfires are typically in climates with a significant dry season, or one that experiences droughts. Wildfires don't have to be dangerous to people. If the fires are in a remote location, we may only feel the effects of smoke or nothing at all. The problem is that we keep building homes in areas that have all the elements that add up to a high wildfire risk. That area is called the Wildland Urban Interface. It's where nature meets the city or low density suburb to be more specific. There's a decent chance I'm gonna step on a rattlesnake out here, so it's nice to know that there's help close by. But those houses are surrounded by fuel for wildfires, and that's not actually an uncommon situation. One study estimates that about 9% of the land area in the United States is within the wildland urban interface. It contains 39% of all houses and over 5 million homes in California alone. There are two different types of wildland urban interfaces. There's intermix, where houses are mixed in with vegetation, and interface, where homes are adjacent to the wildland. Intermix areas are generally in greater danger of wildfire. Fun fire fact, the deadliest wildfire in U.S. history happened near my hometown in northeastern Wisconsin. The Peshtigo Fire, as it's called, burned 1,800 square miles and killed about 1,500 people. But it occurred on the same day as the 1871 Great Chicago Fire, so nobody's ever heard of the Peshtigo Fire. So wildfires can occur all over the world, but I'm going to focus on California for this video because I live here and fires here are very frequent and deadly. I've had to leave my house in the past because wildfire smoke got so bad and I've had a delay on my Amtrak train because fire crews were putting out a wildfire adjacent to the tracks. Fire is just a part of life here. Wildfires are also notable in California because cities continue to grow and push new development out into wildfire prone areas. Suburban growth is the primary reason wildfires have become more dangerous. A lot of it is simple geometry. As cities grow outward, the outer perimeter of urban development gets larger, leading to more wildland urban interface. And cities don't grow out evenly. Development tends to occur in flat, accessible land first, and then hillier, more marginal land gets built up. This results in urban development perimeters that get even larger, and development winds up in canyons and climbs up hillsides. These more marginal areas are not suitable for large-scale tract development or high-density development. So what you get are houses in amongst vegetation, and pretty soon you have a whole lot of wildland urban intermix, the most dangerous kind of interface. Homes in intermix areas on slopes are in particularly dangerous locations, as fires love a good slope. I've just described the kind of housing that happens with minimal land use regulation. Left to its own devices, the housing market would build on those marginal sites. I mean, who doesn't love hillside views? but what if we wanted to minimize the loss of life and property due to wildfire? We'd start by regulating where houses can be built. There are three basic places housing can go in an urban area. First, there's infill development. That's when vacant properties within the urban area get developed into housing, or when a property with a building is demolished or renovated to allow for more housing. Accessory dwelling units are another example of infill housing. The second kind is greenfield development. This is where a developer purchases property on the edge of the city and builds housing where there once was a farm, forest, or some other natural habitat. The final kind is leapfrog development. It's the same as greenfield development, but the new development is not adjacent to the nearby urban area. It leapfrogged over undeveloped land. Leapfrog development should look kind of familiar. Oh yeah, it's basically intermix, the most dangerous kind of interface. And it just so happens that leapfrog development is one of the worst forms of urban sprawl. It's more expensive to run utilities out to leapfrog development, 
and there's no hope of anyone using anything other than a car to get around, adding to regional traffic and emissions. So there's really no reason to build leapfrog development, and many local governments have policies against it and won't approve it. Greenfield development is often low-density single-family homes, sometimes on large lots. This is likely less dangerous than leapfrog development, but can still be risky. One way to mitigate this risk is building more dense housing in less area. That means building multifamily housing or clustering homes near each other. This seems dangerous because fires can more easily spread from house to house, but the benefit is that it's much easier to prevent and fight fires in this land use pattern. The perimeter is smaller, and it also makes it easier for firefighters to focus their resources, as opposed to spreading themselves thin in the face of a large front line of a wildfire. Local governments can also regulate the design of street systems in these areas. Many suburban subdivisions are made up of cul-de-sacs and windy roads, which make it difficult to evacuate and for fire personnel to get to homes. Neighborhoods with a more grid-like pattern are safer in fires, and as a bonus, streets can make a pretty good fire break, or a fuelless barrier between the fire and someone's house. Those land use regulations are great for neighborhoods and homes that haven't been built, but what about the houses that do exist? Are they just doomed to burn? There are precautions homeowners can take, and in some places in California are required to take. The concept is called defensible space. There are two perimeters in defensible space. The first, zone one, is a circle 30 feet around the house. In that zone, you're not allowed to have a wood pile for a fireplace or stove. You can't have tree branches 10 feet from other trees, and you have to remove branches that hang over your house. Zone two takes the perimeter out to 100 feet from the house, and here you have to remove dry plant material like needles and dead branches from the ground and create horizontal and vertical spacing between trees and shrubs. There are some downsides to this aggressive removal of plant material. First of all, you're destroying what makes the property beautiful in the first place. And secondly, you may be removing native and sensitive species, harming the ecosystem. Instead of having a beautiful house in nature, you have a house in a completely man-made landscape. It's another argument for not building in the wildland urban interface in the first place. And really, that's the whole point of this video. Stop building houses in the wildland urban interface where there's a wildfire risk. Climate change is going to make wildfires even more likely, so we need to be extra strict about where we build housing. We need to focus on infill development instead of greenfield and leapfrog development. I've been making videos on this channel for more than two and a half years. In that time, I've published over 50 videos. You'd think that I'd be confident in my abilities as a video producer, and I'm definitely getting there. But there's always a new skill to learn or improve, and I'm really happy to use Skillshare to hone those skills. I've used the animation classes from Kurtzgazat to help me improve my own animations. And I've used the isometric illustration class from DKNG Studios to produce some pretty cool maps. I've also used Thomas Frank's productivity class to keep myself organized and productive through it all. The great thing about Skillshare is that there are thousands and thousands of courses on everything from business, design, productivity, technology, and more. So you don't have to be a YouTuber to find it valuable. If you want to learn anything new for work or for fun, Skillshare has you covered. This isn't just marketing BS. I'm happy to do ads for them because I'm a happy user. You can get started on Skillshare with a two month free premium membership by clicking on the link in the description. If you decide to keep going, an annual membership comes out to less than $10 a month. So please click on the link in the description to get started learning a new skill right now.